with B2B, it's more about what are we doing? What's the value? What's the benefit? What's in it for me? How can it help my career? And how can it help my company? There are so many aspects to that. You need to have such a thorough understanding of what somebody does. The, the most important part is that you uh, realize that you can't make the culture that you have. Um, it, you already have it. You just need to find out which elements of it are the most important and what I absolutely need to keep. Universally, you need to talk to your customers. It's the most important thing in the world because you need to understand what they're going through. And it, it, you don't even need to start at, oh, this is an IT person and I really need to understand IT a little bit more, so I'm going to focus on it. No, just talk to customers to begin with. Hey, welcome to the Message Market Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Silvestri. And if you're new here, this is a show where I chat with B2B SaaS folks in marketing, product, growth, and founders about how they join the conversation already happening in their customers' minds. We dive deep into their thinking, their systems, and their playbooks to see how they empathize with their audience and speak to them in a way that resonates. So they're compelled to take action. Join us and learn how you too can shape your messaging strategy and write copy that truly resonates and differentiates you. I am super excited about my guest today, Jonathan Davis. Jonathan is the product marketing lead at Happio, an internet platform used by companies like Decathlon, Pinterest, and Marketa. In this episode, we go deep into B2B marketing and we chat about how company culture impacts customer interactions, the importance of understanding your target personas, and balancing quantitative and qualitative customer data. Let's dive right in. Hey, Jonathan, thanks so much for being here and welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm doing well, thanks. It's been a while since we last spoke. Yeah, when was it? Was it last year or the year before? I think last No, year, I think it was a year before. Or 2022. Yeah, yeah, 2022. Yeah, it's been two years, yeah. yeah. It's been a minute. <laughs> yeah, lots happened. I'm curious to dive into everything that happened within a the end of a pandemic and then the advent of AI, lots of things to talk about. <laughs> Let's start from some of your background. So I know that you started in PR and content, right? So can you walk me a bit through what were the main lessons and kind of experience that you've had through that? Sure. So when I started my career, I very consciously made the decision after I graduated, and I'm talking like over a decade ago by now, I very consciously made the decision uh, that I wanted to do B2B marketing. I wasn't interested in B2C. I found it too, there's just not enough depth. I really like getting to know the people who will use your product and kind of having the idea of working with them intensely. And if you have the right product to actually change the way that people work or do a specific aspect of their work. So that's the part that excited me. In order to get my career kickstarted, I joined this kind of corporate financial services firm, uh, which I, I mean, we've spoken before me the idea of me having to wear a suit to work every day probably doesn't quite fit your mental image of who I am. <laughs> and it didn't fit mine either. Yeah. Now, I was really lucky, right? Like I, I had the right people to mentor me. I, I tried to go more towards the graphics design field and, and visual design, because that's when I graduated from uni, my, my thesis was on like information design and this type of stuff. And I thought that was it. And then I just found out that I was terrible at making things look good. It's as simple as that. Like sometimes things just aren't your talent, right? But I was really lucky in that I had two people above me who were either former journalists or had a lot of experience with NPR or in this case, either or. And they taught me how to write. And that's how I started because I've been writing for myself from since I was a teenager. Like I, I love listening to music. I would write lyrics and um, I would write diaries and blog posts and that type of stuff. I just took a skill that I knew I had that was really raw and unformed and I needed a lot of guidance but I knew that I had this skill and I combined it with the field that I studied in, which I was very excited about. And from that, I got to create this way of be being a professional storyteller and the safest way to fail. And that's what companies should always do when they have very junior employees is find safe ways for them to fail. For me at that time was to do this mainly with internal communications. So a lot of like internal writing and stuff, I would start to pick up slowly and slowly until that became the largest part of my job next to like project management for the overall comms team. 
And that was great. After two years, they basically said, we're restructuring the marketing team a little bit. Your role is no longer necessary. And to be honest, we think it's probably also best for you if you look for something else, because this probably isn't your dream career, right? Like this or dream company to work for. And they were absolutely right. And again, I got really lucky with the people who guided me there. So then I ended up uh, working in my first tech company for a very short period of time, uh, which I had a lot of great people around me, but uh, the culture there was really bad at that time. So I didn't last very long. And that was one of the most valuable lessons I ever had because I had a manager above me who quite frankly showed me all of the things I should not be doing as a manager later on in my career. And that was one of the most powerful things I ever learned because I know that micromanaging and really breathing down people's necks and that type of stuff is the most toxic thing that you can do working with my generation of people and then also the generation below that, right? Gen Z people, like they need freedom and you need to be able to trust people you hire because else why did you hire them in the first place? So a couple of lessons learned and then I was like, okay, I like the tech thing. I like the writing aspect. I'm doing PR and then I also did internal comms there and I was like, yeah, okay, this is great. But what I think I really can make a difference at is content marketing. So then I found this startup in Amsterdam called Springest. They made a a B2B learning platform, basically. It's like booking.com where you can go and and compare a hotel and a trip. Except here you could compare courses and from a simple first aid course to a full on master's degree and everything in between. And you would have reviews and, you know, hence the booking.com comparison. Obviously there's a lot of companies out there that will have L and D departments. They want their people to learn all of that type of stuff. They had a B2B offering to give people their own learning platform for which employees could book the learnings that were like predefined by the company and pre-approved, right? Uh, preferred suppliers is the term that procurement mm. will usually use. And that company changed my life in the best way possible. They worked completely differently. So they had a holacracy. There was no management. And that's exactly what I needed at that point in time. They had a very high degree of accountability and responsibility. Also exactly what I needed because it taught me to defend my actions, which was really important. And they had an incredibly high degree of learning. So they really lived and breathed what they, the sector that they were selling their product into. And I think like I, I thought I learned, I would learn the most ever there until I came to Happio where everything got accelerated even more. But it was cool to have this because it was like this bootstrapped tech startup that was really great. Now, after two years there, I realized that I love everything about this except for the market itself, because learning is a very local product, right? There's, it's very difficult to have global learning type of things, unless you're looking at mm. e-learning and that type of stuff. So I was like, okay, I want to do what I'm doing now, but I want to do it for a global audience and still in the HR tech world, because that's something that I have more of a passion for at that point in time. I also understood that world better, to be frank. Mm. So great. Okay, cool. Let me look for the next thing. And then Happy, I just came along my path. They were looking that they had just got their seed funding. So we're now on series B funding. Back then they just got their mm-hmm. seed funding round. It was like three months after they had a marketing team of the oh. VP of marketing, basically head of brand, head of growth. And then I would be head of content. That, that was roughly the structure. And that was perfect. Uh, it worked for a really long time. And like from there on, I, I grew and grew. And then to make a long, very long story short, I got to the point where it was, okay, I've finished. If, if content marketing is a video game, I defeated the end boss. I felt like I had very little to mm. learn by just keeping, keep on doing the same thing over and over again. So I figured, okay, cool. There's more and more product marketing things that need to be done. We need to become more and more strategic with what we're doing because we're creating a lot of fuel, but the engine that was built, we weren't building that in a very scalable and, and structured way. So we needed to bring more structure into it because we were wasting a lot of fuel. It's a very popular engine mm. of fuel analogy that I'm sure a lot of your listeners will know, right? <laughs> uh, and then we figured, okay, great. So let's do more and more product marketing things. I was picking that up. It made sense for me to do it because I did internal comms before and we, we create an internet. So we sell among others to internal comms. So I understand these people very well. I've had to build intranets in the past. So I know how cumbersome and terrible it is compared to having a mm. SaaS product, which comes out of the box and it's perfect and ready to go. So it made sense that I picked those things up. It became very difficult to do both things at the same time. So we tried to hire a product marketer but it was really difficult to find the right one. It's such a difficult, it's such a specific product. It's a very horizontal product in internet. And then you're also dealing with a product that gets rolled out to literally every employee in the company. So it's a very high impact, high visible, and can do a lot of things for a lot of people type of product, depending on the yeah. core use cases, right? So it, it was just almost impossible. And then at one point I just said, look, let me take over product marketing. I had two people under me doing content 
who were absolutely great at what they did. And with minimal oversight, I could basically keep them going. Um, I, I said, they can do their thing. They're self-sustainable. They're very responsible. They put out good content. We'll be okay. Let me take on a product marketing thing. And that's what I did for about six months to a year. And then we met and cause we realized it was time to, to like restructure or make the engine a lot more efficient, let's say, mm. cause we needed to figure out, cool, who are we messaging to? What do they really care about? What do they not care about? And the advantage was, and that might be different with some of the people you've worked with is I did a lot of that research because it was really important for me to have done that. Like I'm very, I need to own these type of things. That's really my thing. I, I need to feel like it's mine but I needed somebody else to partner with to really turn that research into messaging that would resonate with the audience. And, and that's how all of these things went. But years later, now I've been over five years at Happio. Now I'm the product marketing lead. I have a team of two under me again. And yeah, we're still going strong, but the, the market is very different post COVID. And also the way that we market is very different now that the organization has changed a lot. So it's even when we last spoke, which was only two years ago, it's like a different world right now, basically. Yeah, um, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> that, so that's that was my very long story. I've been just been talking for a very long time. I'm sorry. I hope I entertained. Yeah, awesome. No, listening. no, <laughs> it's, it's been great. I actually want to touch on two things that you mentioned. So the first one is I'm super curious about the differentiation between B2B and B2C. When you mentioned B2B, you like the depth. And a lot of people might think that when it comes to B2C, it's more on the emotions, more on the personal side. So they might guess that it's quite deep already as far as understanding these people. But then also in B2B, you have the logical aspect, kind of making them, helping them understand the category, the products, but there's also the personal aspect that a lot of people don't look into. So what did you mean exactly by depth in B2B and, and what do you like about it specifically? I'll do my best to try and explain this. So what I notice, I, I think if you were to take somebody who's been marketing B2C for let's say five years, doing comms for them and that type of stuff, and then put them in a B2B world, you and you ask them to make copy for an ad, to name a random example, you would probably get something that's very fluffy and very kind of high level, mm -hmm. top funnel, lifestyle oriented. And with B2B, it's more about what are we doing? What's the value? What's the benefit? What's in it for me? How can it help my career? And how can it help my company? And those, there are so many aspects to that. You need to have such a thorough understanding of what somebody does in order to be able to communicate that accurately. That is just not the same as a consumer wanting to buy a nice pair of headphones, for example. It goes way deeper beyond that. If you're selling a CRM system, for example, you need to live and breathe sales. You need to be obsessed with what they do, but you also need to understand the operations team and what the CEO wants from a CRM export. And it, it's like, it, it's the difference between talking to a person and talking to a crowd or a village or a city even. That's how mm, I see it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah, there's all these dynamics and layers, which makes actually working on a B2B project not only, yeah, it makes it more interesting. It's something, it's like a challenge, at least for me when I work with clients, uh, especially focusing only on B2B. That's totally a challenge. The, yeah, the other and thing I, that I you mentioned was, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think the nice thing about that is that sometimes you can get a little bit lost in it, but it's always important mm. to remember that you're speaking to a human at the end of the day, even if this person is the person who signs the check. I think that's the thing that B2C typically does a little bit better than B2B. B2B can be too far towards the robotic side. <laughs> so that's where I would yeah. say, uh, like, I'm not trying to say if you did B2C, you have no chance, you don't know what you're doing. That's not the case at all. But there is a strong human element to it, which I think that's the art of it. Understanding all the layers of complexity, understanding your target really well, but then communicating to them in a very clear, but also human way. That was, that's a really important kind of subtle balance to try and find. Yeah. Yeah. I think about it as a, like in advertising in the seventies, there was this concept of the big idea, which they still use in direct response. I think that's, there's still room for the big idea, even in B2B, it's just a different way of approaching it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, I, I mean, for that same matter, uh, I still, from the content background, I still do like a writing skills training that I'll do for people who, who work in Happio. And a lot of the things that I've taken from that training come from um, the Adweek copywriting manual, which is like a super old that. book, uh, which a lot of the things don't apply anymore because it was all based around long form copy. But the things that do apply are brilliant. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I still think that a lot of the old things from advertising 
like we've gotten so good at looking at data that we forgot sometimes to look at the human who created that statistic in the first place. And that's the only thing that they could rely on back then. So there is still wisdom in what they did back in ye olden yeah. days, let's say. <laughs> totally. The other thing that I wanted to touch on about what you said was the when you mentioned that the culture was bad at that company. Mm. What did you mean exactly? How do you define a bad culture and a good one? So it, it, it's not fair to say that the culture at the entire company was bad. It was just specifically the team that I was yeah. in at that time. It was just being, I just didn't have a good experience with the manager who was there. And this type of manager would work really well for some people and not so well for others. And I'm the type of person, I'm not very good with people who absolutely all the time feel the need to tell me what I should be doing, how I should be doing it and why and blah, blah, blah. And like, why did you hire me in the first place if all you want me to do is execute what's in your mind? Like that doesn't work for me. I want to feel like I'm an entrepreneur. I want to feel like I can pick up and run with things and own it. And if I feel great, I learned something. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll be the first person to say, yeah, I could have done that better. Yeah. So that it, it, it was just a matter of a mismatch in values. Honestly, it, a, a bad culture is maybe over the top. It was really specifically this team, specifically this manager that I had. And I, I think a lot of people who are listening will at least one point in their life have had a bad experience with the wrong manager and it can happen. It's okay. It's at the end of the day, it's, it was a really strong learning experience for me. It was really stressful, but it was a very strong learning experience. Yeah. So staying on culture, uh, a lot of the work that you do at Happy obviously is about culture. So how do you think a company culture affects the way that you speak to customers, especially when it comes to keeping that like aligning everyone on the culture, not only certain departments, certain teams, and how they communicate to customers. I think now, when I talk about culture nowadays, I talk about culture differently than it was two years ago, like pandemic era culture. I think the post pandemic definition of culture is more around the way that we do work here than it is around how we interact with each other as people. And that makes it a little bit more tangible and that makes it a little bit easier to, to control once you use that definition. Now, culture is still made up by people, don't get me wrong, but there are ways that you can do to really steer that. So I'll give you a random example. At Happio, we recently redefined all of our core values that we had. And that was one of the most powerful exercises that we've ever done. Not because, oh my God, core values and fluff. I've done that before. I've been in branding roles where these things didn't necessarily always mean something to me. But here they actually solidified the most important aspect of how we work with customers. And exceeding customer expectations is a very, for me, is the most important specific value. And I think in B2B is always something that you should be striving for regardless. But to have that solidified as that part of the value directs your decision making in a way that makes you go, okay, if we do that and that, it might cost me a lot of extra effort, but it helps me exceed customer expectations. Therefore, I know it is worth it. So it's, if, I, I don't know if you've ever read Made to Stick, but they have a beautiful chapter in there. You know what I'm talking about? Like the commander's intent part? No, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so basically in, in, there's this book called Made to Stick and in it they describe the commander's intent where they're saying, essentially they're saying a lot of visions that a company will make when you have a vision and mission is it's quite wishy-washy and uh -huh. a little bit vague. But a commander in a battlefield who has to send soldiers in doesn't have the time to communicate with his soldiers, right? They're running away from bullets and, and needing to hide in trenches and yeah. that type of stuff. <laughs> so what the commander does is he says, here's our one goal. So the soldier needs to make a decision on the spot. In, and if the decision is aligned with that one goal, it becomes very easy. So the example in the book that they name is, I think it was from Southwest Airlines, a, an American airline company that mm -hmm. I'm not too familiar with because I'm very European. <laughs> Basically, they, their commander's intent was, we are the low fare airline. So if somebody in purchasing then said, hey, listen, we have the choice between serving a very fancy, luxury, nice Waldorf salad for our passengers or a very simple Caesar salad, which one should I choose to buy? Obviously, buying the very fancy salad does not align with being the low fare airline, despite the fact that it would be good for your customers, because the reason the customers come to you in the first place is for the low fares. So you're gonna go with the Caesar salad. When you have really clear statements like that, really strong intent statements, you create a sense of direction without needing to ask somebody, what do I do? What's the best thing that I should be doing? You become more autonomous in decision-making and your decisions are made closer to what the company needs to move towards. And that's what our core values now really do because they're so concrete. 
Uh, they're so easy to understand. It helps you make a decision that's more in the direction of what you need to do. What's one tip that you would give another organization on how to craft their company values to make them concrete, as you mentioned? So the, the most important part is that you uh, realize that you can't make the culture that you have. Um, you can shape it, but you can't make it. It's made, it, it, you already have it. You just need to find out which elements of it are the most important and what I absolutely need to keep. And you should also be finding out which elements are currently there that I probably want to give a new direction or get rid of entirely. And those things can happen. So, for example, one of the things that uh, they did at Happio, and this was instigated by the HR team, is they would just do a bunch of research with our people. They had interviews with people who had been there for a long time. I've been one of those. And they had interviews with new people. They would say, if you'd had to describe Happio in one word, what would it be? If, yeah. if you had five more, what would it be? And then we went from there. And it, it's basically just qualitative research, what you and I would do if we're trying to figure out which value proposition will stick with a specific yeah. segment of our target group. At, at a certain point, you start to spot patterns and then you can say, okay, cool, this is probably it. Then you work with the management team and that's the most important part because if you don't do that, you can forget all of your trouble. You mm -hmm. work with them and basically say, look, here's what we have back. Here's the input that we have. Which of this do we choose to really put the spotlight on? Because that's what you're doing with core values, right? You're putting the spotlight on elements of your culture that you think are the most important. And that, honestly, it's a very basic qualitative research methodology that works really perfectly fine but you need to be able to have to have the opportunity to speak to people to really get full context around yeah. what they're saying right because if somebody says transparency is our most important value but my definition of transparency is completely different from yours then you're still talking about two completely different things you're not going to get anywhere yeah which is a great exercise i think if any company does that because then it trains you to also do the same for your customers and try to understand them Absolutely, 100%. And that's why, you know, when you're a company like ours, or even if a, a different company that works in HR tech, like, you need to be able to talk to your customers and say, here's how we did it. That's really important. And even if it goes outside yeah. of your products. Yeah, it builds empathy. So going from this high level culture, I know that I remember that when we started working together, you just uh, completed the repositioning project, I think, right? So right. how do you think about this kind of going from the strategy to the copy, for example, positioning, what's the trigger that tells you, okay, we need to revisit our positioning and uh, maybe even our messaging strategy. What's the trigger? What needs to happen for you to guide that? So, so for me personally, one of the core triggers is if I hear, Hey, we, you know, I work at that and that company and here's my product. And I find that description difficult to understand, then that's a problem. That's a trigger to me to want to do something about it. And I think that when you have an internet, because it can do so many things to so many people, I think one of the most important things that I learned from working with you is that you can have a problem aware or a solution aware audience. And in our case, we have both. And most products will have both, mm -hmm. right? The majority will probably skew towards X or Y, depending on the product and the market, et cetera. And I think that when you look at the market in that way, you realize that you have to articulate what you do to two different types of audiences a little bit differently. So for the problem aware audience, you can't lead with, we have these and these integrations and this and that works fantastic. And it's easy to roll out and your time to value will be quick because they, they don't understand why they need your product in the first place. So you need to start with really very clearly artic articulating the problem. And we at that point in time chose to really poke at the pain uh, of information chaos, which was something mm -hmm. that probably in the market, Happio is the only internet that can really solve that if you're a company that runs on Google Workspace. That's just, we're, we're the ones with the deepest level of integration there. So it came from the product where it made sense. It came from interviews where we knew that this is what people were experiencing. We just needed to make a decision of how do we poke at it? What, how do we articulate it? We can say, mm -hmm. for example, something like, we will sort all of your mess which is like a nicer type of message, right? We could say, we'll make sure you never have to worry again, but then it's very vague. Or we could say, we're the solution to information chaos. And then it became very clear, right? That's So that's how we did it at that point in time. And just after A-B testing, A-B-C-D testing at that point in time, I think even we just came to the conclusion where we really, if, if we talked about like really poking at information chaos at that point in time, again, the market has changed a bit. It made the most sense. That was the one that resonated yeah. the best with our audience. Yeah, 
And what, one thing that I loved about working with you was also your super deep knowledge, as you mentioned about the audience, these people, all the different roles. And with Appio, as you said, you have a lot of different ICPs, target personas. So internal communication, HR, IT, and a lot of others, right? Yeah. How do you make sure and, how, and w what would you recommend to other companies to make sure that you always keep in touch with all of these different personas and that you deeply understand them? Um, so it depends which role you have within the company, but universally you need to talk to your customers and I don't care which role you have. It's the most important thing in the world because you need to understand what they're going through. And it, it, you don't even need to start at, oh, this is an IT person and I really need to understand IT a little bit more. So I'm going to focus on that. No, just talk to customers to begin with, because honestly mm -hmm. with us, an IT manager who, who's the core buying persona for an internet can have the exact same problem and the exact same goals as an internal comms manager that can happen. It's just really important. What are their pains? How can our solution help? Like you need to understand these points very strongly. What does their day to day look like? What other tools are they managing? What keeps them awake at night? All of these types of things. So if, if you don't understand that at any company that you work for, and this is again, going back to why I like B2B, this is part of the reason you really need to understand that super thoroughly. I think that not enough marketers are really obsessed with their target groups and their ICP segments and this type of stuff. And I think one other thing that we found out, and that's really important is how to take like it, when you have a product like Happio, because it, like I've said before, it can do so many things for so many people. If you have data to back up what it does for which person, then it becomes far more, far easier to digest and box in who I need to learn from what, which problem maps to which persona the best, all of that type of stuff. Yeah. And that's something that we got so much better at. So first we 100% fought one specific audience. That's exactly who we go for. And it turned out there's four. They all have some overlap with problems, but we neglected three others in favor of one. And that was not necessarily always the smartest thing to do, which also we very quickly realized that and then we adjusted. So one of the things, for example, that we found where we have a very strong market fit is the education sector, which makes full on sense. We work really well with charter schools in the United States because they're autonomous in decision making, but they experience a lot of basic pains of, for example, a teacher. A teacher is in a classroom, not behind a laptop very often, they do not go and look up work stuff when they're at home because when they're at home, they're exhausted and they shut off. You have a limited mm -hmm. amount of time to reach these people to get them information about what's happening at your school or to make sure that they can access critical policies and information. Now, it was really easy for me to explain this to you. The, re the reason why I could easily explain this to you is because I did a lot of research into yeah. who are the people <laughs> that experience this problem, not just who own the platform, but who are the users, all of this type of stuff. So I really understood, cool, we have a really strong market fit here. People are very happy with us in that specific segment. There's good value here. We're seeing growth. Education is awesome anyway. As a company, that's something we'd love to work with. And there's a strong fit with Google Workspace obviously because education and Google Classroom and that type of mm -hmm. stuff. So fantastic. Let's talk more to them. Yeah. And, and I also loved that the, I, I, when we were together, I watched a lot of, was it like sales calls or demos? And you were on a lot of those, which it's interesting to me. And I was wondering, is that something that came easy, like convincing the whole company? Okay. I need to be on these calls because a lot of, a lot of my potential clients sometimes they can't prioritize research because they can't get buy-in from other people, from other, from yeah. like higher up. So how would you recommend people get that buy-in and make research a constant? First, I was lucky enough that people would actually want me to be on those calls. So I didn't even need to ask people. They said, I want you there. And part of the reason why they wanted me there is because I'm not just researching and asking a person and taking and taking. I can also offer some actual advice back because I have all of this overview and I have done research before, so I can give the person on the receiving end of the call a little bit of insight that helps them too. For example, if a, a customer success manager knows that, then they know that there's not just like, it's a win. There's value in it for the pro for the customer at that point in time, there's value in it for us and there's value in it for the CSM because they strengthen the relationship. So why wouldn't they do it? And then second, I think if you're having trouble getting that done. Look, especially if you're looking at something like positioning, you need to absolutely start with research. That's always the first thing that I'd say, but do just research without having to talk to people first. 
the moment that you've done some initial research and you can form some hypothesis around, I think we need to position towards this segment in the market and these specific problems. And here's our real value proposition. Here's our real positioning statements. Here's where the competition differs from us. Once you have like a, a rough framework of that, approach your leadership team and tell them that and then say, we need to solidify this. We need to dive deeper into this because if we can really make this concrete, there's huge opportunity to, for example, increase our sales win rates, to increase the um, time it, or to decrease the time it takes to close leads, to increase conversion from the website, uh, to increase the quality of leads, any and all of these things. So find out where the pain lies first. Is it, you know, we're, we're getting a bunch of leads, but they're all junk? Or is it, we're getting a lot of really cool people, but it takes a year and a half to close these deals, right? Any and all of those are possible figure out where that pain lies, approach the leadership team and say, I, here are my f initial findings. This is our pain point. I recommend that we go proceed like this and then say, in order to do that, I need to do some research and I need to talk to people. I need you to help me help the company, basically. Help me get that done. Yeah. And then trust me, it will get done like that. But that's for any product marketer and anybody who's working on positioning in general, you have to work with the leadership team, especially the CEO, and if possible, also the VP of product or chief product officer or, or however your structure is, because a buy-in needs to come from that. And it's part of the reason why it really worked with me very well. I have a good, strong relationship with our now VP of product, who's excellent, who used to be our VP of solutions. And we literally would go over web copy together after all of the research, right. because he really cares about how we talk about what we do to the market, even cool. though it's not his expertise, quote unquote, he has strong opinions about it. Great, amazing. I have a stakeholder I can leverage to make my work qualitatively better. Fantastic. So spend time in building those relationships and make sure that you argue why you're doing something towards a company problem. Because if you're not doing that, yeah. then it doesn't make sense. And how does it work with sales? For example, how do you make sure that what you learn from these calls or from your research gets implemented in the sales process? Oh, that's a fun question because I recently changed how I did that quite a lot. I think yeah. what we did in the past that didn't work is outcome of all of these research findings, we would form that into a presentation that was r relatively easy to digest. And that would be kind of it. Great. And I think anybody's doing avoid. Exactly, right? Like <laughs> you, repetition is the key to success, right? How do I get to Carnegie Hall? You try and you try again. <laughs> and I really, I was not good at that. And I think that one part, one core part behind the reason for that is that doing a presentation is just a one shot event. It, it's a it's a moment in time that's fleeting. But if you have more of a knowledge archive or something that's asynchronously available that people can read when they actually have the time, and you combine those two together, then you have a powerful tool. So ironically, I realized that I needed to leverage Happio itself a lot more. For example, when I did a lot of research into the education sector, like we just spoke of, um, the way that we put that out, and, and I have to give full credit to, to Rachel, our chief revenue officer. She was like, look, great work. This is stuck in a mirror board. How are you going to make it actionable? What are you going to do with it? And then I was like, yeah, good question. What should we do? She was like, why aren't we making this into a happier page so that people could actually look at it? And you can have a segment in there for SDRs so that they understand uh, different types of education companies, right? Because there's a big difference between K-12 grade school and a university, for example. So they need to understand the differences. Yeah. We also need a section for rev up so that they understand what's a total addressable market. We need a section for sales so that they understand which kind of core problems they should initially pitch around, all of this type of stuff. So it was just such a logical move of, of making things far more asynchronously available in an easy to digest way that's still very, that still goes quite in depth. And then after that, it's a matter yeah. of having strong campaigns and, and like strong supporting marketing collateral and that type of stuff that, that echoes that message that you've put out before. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, I love that with Appio, it's basically, it's a very good case study of eating your own dog food, right? <laughs> because you're basically doing the same thing that you recommend your customers do. And I was wondering, especially knowing a bit of Appio, I know that there's a, you get a lot of data on how people use the internet, right? Uh, on the usage, what they do, how much they are involved and invested in it. So I was wondering, how do you think about the balance between quantitative data and the qualitative data for understanding customers? So quantitative, quantitative, wow, nice one. Quantitative data, 
uh, is for me kind of like knowing the city you need to visit on Google Maps. And qualitative data shows you the specific street that you need to navigate to. Let me elaborate on what that means so that yeah. I'm not wishy-washy. Essentially, <laughs> quantitative data will show me at first where a prob problem area would be or a specific thing that I need to adjust or where we are having great success. So it gives me some sort or form of initial direction. But I need to supplement that with qualitative data to really understand, for example, if messaging is hitting home. So one of the things that we really did is we used quantitative data from our CRM to figure out where's the most revenue coming from, where are we seeing the most traction, which personas, all of this type of stuff, that was one. And mm -hmm. then with qualitative data, I would form some messaging towards these specific personas, specific industries, and I would test that with them. And then I'd gauge their reactions and I'd understand what is coming from that. So that's one, it, it's a really, it's the best way to asset test anything because you get rich context in answers. Numbers don't give you context at all. They just tell you a peak or a drop and that's basic or an average and that's basically it. So you need really strong context in order to make the right decision. And then number two, every time that you look at a graph, like, like you can look at the same graph five times over and you'll see the same thing five times over. But you ask the same mm. question to five different people, you'll get five different answers. So you learn something new yeah. every single time. And that's to me, that's also why I'm so passionate about research because I'm really big on continuously learning all the time. And it just, sometimes I have one of those, aha, eureka, eye-opening moments that makes me go, wow, I really wish I thought of that before. And you just can't get that from a graph. It's almost impossible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned testing. What's the, what are your favorite ways of testing? I know that you used to run a lot of A-B tests. You probably still do. You were constantly testing, which I loved. <laughs> Yeah, A-B tests are nice for conversion, but for me, preference tests are way more preferred. I'll give you an example. I've done a lot of research into one specific segment. I found out who the key persona is, what the core problems are, probably made a total addressable market list, something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Then after that, next step, form some messaging, create like a campaign-ish type of feel around it, make sure that they have all the right collateral. I don't know if that messaging is correct. I'm just making a very informed decision. So what do I do? I can go straight to A-B testing by putting this page live, spend a whole bunch of money on ads trying to get people to click only to then find out that they're not converting. Or I can spend a little bit of money, do a preference test. So for example, Winter is a really great and easy to use tool for that. And probably if you could do focus groups or live interviews or, or anything along those lines, any and all of these things are options as well. Usability Hub, whatever, there's tons of tools that will help you with this. If I do a preference test, I can basically have a landing page with the exact same messaging blocks everywhere, but I can change the header. And I can just ask people, which one do you prefer? Which one would you click? And which one would make you read on? And then why? And that's all I need to know. And right then and there, I will probably know which is the winning concept that is worthy of A-B testing. So when I've chosen the winning concept, I'll put that live on the site and then we'll A-B and sometimes C or D test with really minor tweaks. So I'm talking about maybe changing one verb or maybe changing an adjective mm. or a color even, right? So it's like initial messaging, initial messaging concept, final messaging with tiny tweaks. That's roughly my sort of funnel yeah. idea of how I approach testing. Nice, nice. Love it. When it comes to an internet, I'm curious, what's the most surprising way that you've seen a customer use Happio? And, and what did you learn from it about your product? I've seen customers use it to full on project manage. And I didn't expect that initially because wow. I don't see us as like an, an Asana or a ClickUp or, or whatever, right? With tasks and, and big project lists and yeah. all of that type of stuff. Kanban. But the reason why it worked so well for its customers is because they had a very distributed team uh, and in their specific business, which was in the professional services sector, their people are always sitting with clients. So they're never, almost never in the office together. So they needed one place where all of the information and files could be dumped and brought together within context. And then one person, in this case, a project manager, could maintain and oversee that and send the latest updates and all of these type of things. So basically what they were doing is they were giving them their team, their individual members, the soldiers in that field, all of the information they needed in order to make all of the right decisions, which I thought was a brilliant way of doing things and a very business concrete way of just getting shit done, which was amazing. <laughs> awesome, awesome. 
All right, so let's switch a bit with the last couple of questions. Um, I saw something that you wrote on LinkedIn, which I loved, which was about when it comes to posting on LinkedIn, especially with all the LinkedIn think boys and now AI comments, you wrote something that goes, was along the line, where's the human behind the template? What, yes. what did you mean with that? And how do you sound more human on LinkedIn? I literally, it's funny, I literally just had a conversation with a colleague about this yesterday. Look, we live in a world where information is available basically free. Um, you can genuinely get all of the information that you would get from a master's course by going through YouTube videos if you have curated content. That's, I honestly believe that's the depth of in, uh, information available on the internet. But with that also come a couple of like best practice ways of doing things. The top three things you must do when you post on this, make sure that your template follows this format. And one of the things that I've seen which I like to poke fun at a little bit is like the explosion of coaches, people who will coach you with jobs, coach you for <laughs> well-being, coach you for, I don't know, ev uh, how to make a better omelet. Like uh, it, it, it's the amount of niche specific coaches has, has really exploded. Yeah. And look, I had coaching last year myself and I will say I was very skeptical, but oh my God, it changed my life. It was the best thing I ever did, but this was very marketing job specific. Uh, uh, coaching, right? It, 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 it went a little bit further. Yeah. Exactly. So what, what I was seeing now is that there's just a lot of people who will either after maybe 25 years or, or 30 years of working a specific job, they decide that they want to start something for themselves and they gained a lot of knowledge during that time so they can coach people on it. But maybe they did something that doesn't involve any form of promotion themselves. So they have to learn how to promote themselves. And one of the things that I just noticed is that a lot of people go on YouTube for example, and be like, okay, how to make engaging posts on LinkedIn. And it's like, you get that one template from this that I kept seeing back and it recurred all of the damn time. And it just became very tiring. Um, there's a lot of those posts that you see that go, oh my God, you won't believe the terrible thing that I went through yesterday. That and that company did this for their employees and it's really bad. And it's like, there's no proof behind it. I have no idea if this is correct. I think you're just putting it out there to get that LinkedIn effect, that validation. I just don't believe it's the right way of doing things. I think if you want to start posting on LinkedIn and, and get your voice out there, you need to, it, 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 templates are there for a reason. They give you a good start, right? It's, that's how I treat tools like Gemini or ChatGPT or, or any LLM AI that's available. I, I treat it as a starting point, but it's never ever a final product. You should, if you don't know how to begin or you don't have inspiration or you're just doing 15 things at the same time, fantastic. Use, use a template to begin with. Use ChatGPT to begin with no problem, but yeah. it's a, just the beginning, make it your own. And I think the only way you can do that is by really thinking, who am I? What makes me unique from somebody else? What do I really care about? What makes me tick? Um, and what do I feel I have to contribute to the world? And once you've noted down all of those things, it's just a matter of basic storytelling techniques of like, how do I tell a story that captivates people within basic copy? And then you can go into how do I optimize my copy? Or how do I make a more compelling video or something along those lines? But that authenticity is what I feel is missing. It's, it's, you can't be authentic if you just follow a template all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think about rather than templates, I like to think about as frameworks. So a framework you can kind of navigate in between, adapt it, change it. A template is that rigid structure, right? So working with frameworks, I think is much easier. And more effective. I'm 100% with you. Yeah, 100% frameworks just give you consistency and that's good, but they still give you freedom and templates yeah. take that freedom part away. Yeah. Awesome. Last question is what did you learn from your twins about understanding people? Really, really fun question. So <laughs> my twins, so I have a boy and a girl, Alice and Oliver, and they look absolutely nothing alike. They are twins only in name. Okay. So when we walk with them and they're in like this joint stroller type of situation, people will be like, are they twi twins? Really? Twins? And we'd have to be like, yes, really they are. And basically Oliver is a copy of his mom. My wife's from Israel. He looks a bit more Middle Eastern, let's say. And Alice is a copy of me. She looks exactly like I did when I was a kid. So she's <laughs> more pale and has a blonde hair thing going on. But then on the other hand, their characters are completely inverted. So Alice is far more out there. She's really loud. She's really, this is what I want. That's what I want. And everybody will know about it. And Ollie is a little bit more chill and easygoing. Look, I, I know uh, people from uh, the Middle East and specifically Israel, culturally speaking, um, they have more of a culture of really speaking up, right? They're not, they're not as reserved, let's say, 
Whereas Dutch people or English people, which both those are both parts of my culture, are the opposite. They're far more reserved and stuff. So when you look at Alice, you would think, oh, that's probably what she is. And then you look at Ollie and you'd be like, oh, he's probably like the Israeli. Come here and uh, give me all of this. No, it's <laughs> not like that at all. So they stay true to my own purpose, which is they defy expectations just by being who they are. Mm -hmm. So it's the you can't judge people a book by its cover. That's one thing. But then two is also, and anybody who has kids will know this, it's never the same. It's never stagnant. It always changes. When originally, when they were younger, let's say half a year ago, they're only a year and a half now, but half a year ago, I thought Oliver would be an engineer. And Alice, we didn't quite know yet. Her character was still a little bit more developing. And now I would almost say it's the complete opposite. Or, and now, two months from now, I'd probably say Alice will go in sales and Oliver will be a psychologist or whatever. It constantly changes because they they just grow and change and develop so much and sometimes we forget that people also do that me talking to you now after i don't know the last time that we had an in-depth conversation was two years you went through a lot of things yeah. in the meantime you you changed and I, I don't know about that to me you're still chris we change less than babies do obviously yeah but there are some parts <laughs> of you that really changed a lot and that's of course we need to hold that into mind <laughs> awesome yeah it's like positioning right positioning always evolves so Constantly have to look for it <laughs> and optimizing. That's that, that's nice. That's nice. so. Wait, let me now. I really want to hear from you because you're a twin as well. So, like, yeah, you, are you twin. very different? Are you very different from your brother? Actually, no. We are pretty much similar, apart from tattoos. Maybe I'm a bit more introverted. Is a bit more extroverted. But again, that changed over the years. So, yeah, it changes based on our experiences. The the thing is that we are so close that we also have kind of the same experiences. We do, we do most things together. So our evolution is similar along the same lines. So <laughs> yeah, it, we're pretty similar in this case. And we, we, which is actually nice because it's like having a, like a best friend for life. So yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's, that, that's nice. That's the difference you see as well when you're raised with somebody always by your side, you're very different. I think fundamentally as a human being than even if you just have a brother or sister who came later, like it, it's, I'm seeing yeah. that there's a difference uh, already. When one of our kids is playing by themselves because the other is still asleep, they look a little bit lost, uh, more so mm -hmm. than when the other is there, even if they don't interact together at all. So yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah, interesting. That, the sixth sense twins. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. awesome, Jonathan. Thank you so much. It's been great. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks. Again. Thanks, Chris. I really, really enjoyed this. Yeah, looking forward to, to keeping in touch, mate. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, the best thing you could do to support the show and help me as a small business owner would be to leave a review. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and let me know what you think. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe. And if you have any feedback, questions, or suggestions for future episodes, just hit me up on LinkedIn at Christopher Silvestri or Twitter at Silvestri Chris. Speak to you next time.